I invite you to remain standing for this morning's gospel reading. I, I read from the second chapter in Matthew, the first 12 verses, but I preach today really on the, the whole chapter, all of the, uh, the second chapter of Matthew. So keep your thumb in there uh, as I finish these words as we get ready to explore these stories together. Here now, verse 1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and we have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from, the exact, from them exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of him went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, welcome to 2019. Welcome to the new year as we turn the page on 2018. Maybe you all have had the same experience that I have had. Over the last couple, three weeks, we have seen a lot of year in reviews, haven't we, about 2018 uh, in social media, maybe in media in general. It seems that at the end of the year, everyone in one way or another is asking the same question. What went wrong? I mean, think about it. Think about how we, uh, we kind of couch these end-of-the-year reviews. We, we talk about uh, all of the, obviously, the, uh, the political pundits talk about what the other side did wrong all throughout the course of the year and how they've uh, uh, messed up our whole country. And uh, even in, in, in terms of uh, the kind of the uh, world of uh, celebrity, we see that these are the people that we have uh, lost, the people who have died over the course of uh, of the last year, or, or even for uh, sports fans, if you're a, a member of a, uh, one of the kind of sports uh, social media sites, uh, you'll see that you see these year in review things as well. Well, what, what our team should have done, or who we should have traded for, or, or what this pitcher should have done instead, right? We see all these uh, year in review questions of basically the same question. Well, what went wrong in 2018? Well, I don't know about you, but for me, 2018. Uh, it was a hard year in many ways. It felt like a lot went wrong. Many of you will know that uh, several members of our congregation have been hurt and concerned about our congregation's vote in October, and many have chosen to leave the church. It's been a painful time for many, and I have felt that pain as well. I've been hurt, and I feel like I've been the target of accusations that have been unfair. I've been angry, wishing that people would uh, talk to me instead of talking about me. Uh, but mostly, I've been sad. I've been sad because a lot of these are 10-year, almost 10-year relationships. People that mean a lot to me and have meant a lot to me for close to a decade. People I've worshipped beside, people I've studied the Bible with, practiced biblical hospitality with Family Promise or the Food Pantry, those who have um, done God's mission uh, in Lawrence or around the world beside. I'm sad. I'm sad to consider that these relationships will forever be different, if not ended. Sad that uh, as I look out, I won't see them in their favorite pew on a Sunday morning. Sad because I feel their pain, their hurt, 
that they felt disenfranchised or left out or angry or all of the above. I'm sad because I care about them and I grieve that loss. I miss them and it hurts. Some of you also know that 2018 was difficult uh, for other more personal reasons. Many of you know that the week before Christmas, Kimberly's mother passed away. Um, in the days before Christmas, we were able to, um, to see that perhaps the end was near, and so we drove up to spend some time with her, and were able to be with her for her final moments on this earth. A few days later, I was able to return and participate in the service of celebration of life and be with the family over the coming days and weeks. Needless to say, it hurts. It hurts because of the love that I had for my mother-in-law, uh, the love that I have for her husband who is grieving, the love I have for her daughter who is grieving, for her grandchildren who are grieving. It hurts because I know that in 2019 and beyond, we won't have those memories to share with her. She won't be a part of those memories as we come to her birthday or to the holidays or to special days. It is sad and it hurts. Now, some of you might be asking, why am I being so personal today? What does this have to do with me, perhaps you would ask today? Uh, maybe while these are my griefs, I would wager that some of them are your griefs as well. My guess is that you have your own griefs from 2018, friends and family members that you have lost, relationships that have ended. Maybe some of you feel the same as me, sad to have lost fellow church members. For me, these are 10-year relationships. For some of you, they're 20 or 30 or 40 or longer. You understand sad. You understand grief. Some of you perhaps are happy with the way the vote turned out, um, but unhappy that others have left. And yet, others are unhappy with the vote and unhappy that others have left a, a double grief that you deal with in these days. Grief abounds. And our worlds are turned upside down. Well, that's all well and good, Pastor, but what does that have to do with today's passage? What does that have to do with Matthew or the wise men or the magi, you might ask? And if I believe we take a closer look, it is a passage filled with grief filled with pain, filled with worlds turned upside down. Today, today is Epiphany Sunday, and it pulls together these various stories of the Magi and these related narratives, and, and three specifically jump out at me as stories of grief. First, uh, read the way that Matthew talks about Jerusalem in their grieving. Uh, Jerusalem felt as if their world was turned upside down. The way Matthew tells this story, the Magi show up and, and ask the, the king where the new king is. Now, obviously, uh, Herod doesn't love the question because he's the current king and uh, doesn't like where this conversation is going. Uh, and so he is upset. He is anxious. He is concerned. He is frightened. But then it says, according to Matthew, all Jerusalem with him shares that fear. Which is an interesting way to put it, isn't it? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of Jerusalem loved Herod, that all of Jerusalem uh, wasn't a little bit unhappy with Herod, but, but we as people love stability, do we not? A new king usually meant a violent uprising, which created some kind of collateral damage. And so the news of these coming wise men, the news of a new king, meant that, that Jerusalem would be turned upside down, and the, the, the city was frightened as a result. Second, we see the holy family turned upside down. In the passage after I read, Herod's anger burned against Joseph and Mary and the baby and threatened their safety, threatened their very existence. And so the angel warned them, take your family away, flee to Egypt. But think about how this turned their world upside down. A new culture, a new language, an end to any of the family support they would have gotten in Nazareth. Their world is turned upside down. And then in the next passage we read, Maybe even the most painful story of grief. It's the, the death of the innocents. You see, uh, Herod is so angry and so jealous that he commands all of the children under the age of two to be killed. Can you imagine the weeping, the pain, the grief that would have taken place in that city, in that community? Imagine in a town that size, everybody would have known somebody who was affected personally by that violence on that death. 
It would have caused deep pain and deep anger and deep grief. Their world would be turned upside down. And Jerusalem and Bethlehem, the Holy Family, all of the, the chaos and the pain that these families had to deal with. It is the grief of loss. The story of the birth of Christ is a story of worlds turned upside down. No, I'm not saying that your grief, or not saying that my grief is exactly the same as the grief that we read in the scriptures. But we can see it, we can understand it, right? Because we know, we know that pain, and we understand even just a portion of that fear and that pain and that chaos that was felt. We know what it feels like to have our worlds turned upside down. But now, look again at what happens in the midst of that chaos. Look again at what takes place in the midst of these worlds turned upside down because the story of Epiphany is the story of the Magi, the story of the wise men, and the story of God speaking light into pain, speaking joy into grief. Look again at all of these worlds that have been turned upside down. First, look what happens to the Magi when they get to Jerusalem. Uh, they have left their homes. They have left their families, their, their own comfortable surroundings. They've gone uh, to the, uh, they've left uh, to, to follow the, the star uh, to see maybe, maybe there'd be some good news. Maybe there's something hopeful. Now, uh, people don't usually pack up all of their belongings uh, and leave their home if everything is going peachy back home. Something was wrong in their lives, and so they were looking for a better day, a better, a better word, a better hope, a better uh, understanding of what was happening. And look what they did. They came to Jerusalem, and they hoped that this new king would bring them that joy. And look at the way the passage again and again and again uses that word. Look at the joy that they found. When they found the star again, they were overjoyed, all of that, before they even found the baby. Because they had hope. Because they knew in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their fear, there was hope for something better. And then the Holy Family experiences the same sense of hope. What do they do when uh, the Magi find the child? God has led them there into Egypt by way of an angel. God has uh, protected them and cared for them. Uh, God sends the angel to Joseph uh, in order to, to protect them from that violence. God sends the angel to the Magi to protect them from going back into the, the clutches uh, of Herod. When the Magi found them, what did, what did they do? They opened up their chests. They poured out their gifts. They gave everything that they had to this child, to this baby, because they had hope in a better day. They had hope that something would be better at the end of that day. They were from some other country. This wasn't even a, a political king that they had to deal with. But they knew that this child would somehow change things. Not just for, for people in, in Jerusalem, but for everybody in the whole world. They had hope that this child would bring a new day. And finally, even in the pain of the death of the innocents, we read of hope. It is a God who cares for us in the midst of our grief. Those in the midst of our pain. Matthew's use of the, the story of Rama, if you read the, the passage, he says that there's crying, wailing heard in Rama. There's two different reasons why this is a, an important uh, place name to the people who heard this the first time. Uh, the first one is, is Rachel. Rachel uh, is one who, who would, would weep because she did not have a, a child. She wanted so deeply and so dearly uh, to bear a child but did not have one until the day when God blessed her with Samuel. So even in the weeping and the wailing that she felt, there was hope. And Samuel became the first prophet and became a voice to generations and beyond. And then Ramah was important because when the, uh, the exile began, when all the Babylonians gathered together the people to be exiled, where did they put them? They placed them first in Ramah. And there was again weeping and wailing as they went off into exile together. <laughs> but Matthew knows the rest of the story, right? He knows what happened. They came back. They returned from exile. They returned back because God is faithful. Because even in the midst of their grief, even in the midst of losing everything, the land, the temple, their lives, their families, their homes, God was faithful. And Matthew knew for the Magi, for Jerusalem, for Bethlehem, for the Holy Family, that God would be faithful in the midst of their grief. They would not be overwhelmed. Matthew was the one who <laughs> wrote the rest of the gospel. Matthew wrote about Christmas because he knew about Easter. Because he knew the end of the story. He knew what the end of the story was going to be. He knew that even though this world would be, would be violent toward this child, 
would be destructive toward this child as he became a man. They knew in Matthew's church because he told them the end of the story. He told them of the hope. He told them with joy that there would come a day when Jesus would stand on the mountaintop with his disciples and say, I will never leave you or forsake you. That is the word that echoes throughout the Magi's uh, moments with the child and throughout the entire gospel and throughout our time and our grief. That we will never be alone. God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. And so today I invite you to bring your grief here. I invite you to bring your grief to God to say, even in the midst of your world turned upside down, yes, God, grant me that joy. Maybe it seems to you like God is lost in the darkness, that God has given up on you and that you don't matter anymore in God's eyes, that you can't uh, make that pain go away, that God is absent in your life or your family or your church or your nation or your world. But hear the words of the Magi today, that they are overwhelmed with joy in the midst of worlds turned upside down. They spoke joy into the people of God, into the people that are hurting. And so maybe today you need to bring that grief here and you need to bring it and set it on the altar before God. You need to look together to the God of Christmas and the God of Easter. You need to look to the star of wonder and the star of light. You need to, to look for that promise that God is alive and well and at work in our world. You need to listen for the angel's message, indeed, that God is healing and protecting and walking beside us as we go. Look to the world turned upside down and see in 2019 that God is doing something new that God is doing something a better. Well, what is God leading us to? We don't even know, but we know that God lies ahead. How do we see the God who will not leave us or forsake us? How can we bless those who have gone from our presence, either from our, 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 this world or even from our own church? How can we pray for those who are gone, grieving that they are no longer with us, but blessing them on their journey? If we truly believe that God is the God of joy in the midst of pain, then of course, we are given the strength to do just that. Margaret Markison is a church blogger, a wise soul, and she reminds us of the light that God brings. She asks, well, why, why is it that at the end of the year we always focus on what went wrong? Why, why don't we look at what went right, she asks. Why don't we look back on our past and say, these are the things that went well. These are the things that went right. And so she asks these questions and invites us to do the same. She says, well, what went right at your church? What went right in your personal relationships? What went right for you spiritually? What went right for your health? What did you learn? What did you read? What new things did you try? What a powerful list. One that perhaps might help us focus on the light that God offers instead of the chaos that seems to overwhelm us. Questions that help us focus on the star of wonder and light. The word epiphany literally means revelation. It is God revealing the light in the midst of the darkness of our world. And I know that I've talked before about one of my favorite short stories by Flannery O'Connor by that name, Revelation. And in her short, short story titled Revelation, it tells the, uh, the story of a good old church lady, Mrs. Turpin. Now Mrs. Turpin looks around the world and sees what's wrong with everybody else. There's a scene early in the story in which she's sitting in a doctor's office and she's silently judging all of the different people in the doctor's office, saying, well, look at that person. That person's not what they're supposed to be and that person's not what they're supposed to be. And throughout the story, she continues to judge. She continues to look at what is wrong with other people until the end when at sunset she stands on her farm and sees the sun turning the sky a beautiful purple. And as she looks up into this, she has a vision, a revelation from God in which she, she sees that, that purple streak as a bridge all the way to heaven. And on that bridge go God's welcomed. Now, she looks up and she sees a lot of people like herself, good church ladies and church gentlemen, folks like me, folks like maybe some of you, 
but they are not at the front of the line. <laughs> no, they're kind of trailing, wondering why they didn't get picked to lead the parade. But they are welcomed, just like everybody else, but leading the way at the front of the line, beginning all the way up into the stars of heaven, are those outsiders that she judged. Those that she looked down her nose at. Those that she said were wrong and weren't quite good enough. They are leading the celebration with their hands raised up in the air. Those who have been on the margins. Those who have been the outsiders. Those just like these magi who have been on the outside looking in. Raising their arms. Celebrating that they are welcomed into God's glory. They lead the songs. Maybe not quite as in tune as the good church ladies. But they know how to praise. And they know that they are welcomed and loved in God's kingdom. God is a God who opens our eyes to the light. God is a God who reminds us, even in the midst of our grief, that there is joy. God is a God that even in the midst of, of our pain, there is light. That even in the midst of our hurting, there is hope. Today, let us join Mrs. Turpin and the rest as we walk into glory, into God's future, into the days ahead.